Good afternoon to all attendees and panelists. My name is uh, Lalini Virasami and I am the IOM Chief of Mission in Dublin. Myself and the team in here in Ireland are very pleased to host this first webinar in collaboration with the Global Migration Data Analysis Center, GIMDAC in Berlin, which focuses on the importance and impact of data migrants and particularly in the current context of COVID-19. This is of particular interest for IOM and the UN system at large, but also very relevant to all technical and financial partners working with migrant communities to help us understand what else do we need to do to mainstream migrants within responses and plans and have systems in place to better report on migrant populations considered as at risk populations and unfortunately, oftentimes targets. I would like to thank all the panelists who have agreed to participate today. It is particularly a great honor and uh, a pleasure to welcome and introduce David Donahue, who has agreed to act as moderator in this webinar. David has assumed various high positions, level positions within Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs. He was Ireland's permanent representative for the UN until August 2017 and during that time served as co-facilitator for three major negotiations worldwide, including the uh, agreement to the SDGs and, of course, as you all know, to the uh, New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants in September 2016, which, as we all know as well, paved the way to the adoption of the Global Compact on Migration in 2018. A warm welcome to all the attendees joining today from all over the world. We encourage you to raise any questions that you would have throughout the different presentations by sending them to all the panelists in the chat room. David, thank you again for agreeing to uh, assume this role of moderator and over to you. Lenini, thank you very much um, for the uh, kind introduction. I'm delighted to have been asked to moderate uh, this first webinar and uh, congratulations to you and IOM in Ireland on this initiative and also to the Global Migration uh, uh, Data Analysis Centre in Berlin. Um, it, one can't really overestimate the importance of gathering uh, and analysing data at, at the present time in particular, relating to migrants, refugees and indeed asylum seekers. Um, I mean, it, the, the, the science of gathering data on migration issues, it's still in its infancy, but IOM has has led the way and, and the work being done by Jim Jack in Berlin is, I think, um, uh, proving particularly valuable. So without further ado, let's get into the, um, the, the agenda for the, the webinar today. Um, uh, we have an excellent uh, uh, series of speakers um, and uh, it's my very great pleasure to, uh, to, to open this part of the, of the program. Um, I think the, uh, for those uh, attending the event, we will begin with um, contributions of roughly five to seven minutes from each of the panelists. We will then have a short interactive session among the, the panelists, and then we will open up um, the floor to questions, comments, as, as Larini was just indicating. Um, from the wider attendance. So it's my very good pleasure to begin by uh, introducing Frank Lasko, who's the head of um, the Global Migration Data Analysis Centre in Berlin. Frank will give us a data perspective on the current COVID-19 crisis and also, I think, more, more generally. Frank, over to you. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lalini. Great pleasure to be part of this uh, set up this afternoon and to be on a on a wonderful panel. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but I want to make three points uh, about the current crisis from a data perspective. Um, first of all, um, I think it's clear that all of us um, realize that COVID-19 is likely to be something of a game changer for my global migration and migration policy. Um, not long ago, we were all talking about the age of migration and suddenly within a couple of months, as my colleague uh, Nuno Nunes will explain, 
um, mobility is almost ground to a halt and restrictive measures can be found all across the world. So we're in a completely different situation. And uh, the first point I want to make is that uh, in the migration field, there is a huge demand now as a result of COVID-19 for uh, information about the impact of COVID-19 on migration and migrants around the world. And there, are very, and there are different sorts of information that we are looking at and need. Uh, within our organization, we're very concerned about the social and economic impact of uh, COVID-19 on migrants who may be uh, uh, amongst those at greatest risk in many populations. Those may be, they may be among those most likely to be uh, left behind. Um, they are also often subject to uh, uh, racist incidents, xenophobia. Um, there are problems that this uh, COVID-19 could have major implications for efforts to integrate migrants in different destination countries. Uh, COVID-19 will also have implications for migration and development. We heard last week from the World Bank, which reported that, that we could see a short a, a drop in remittances in the in the region of uh, uh, one uh, one billion dollars uh, to developing countries. Um, we there there is also uh, a reduction in uh, return migratory movements, although some that we have seen some forced movements. And then there are many migrants who are stranded around the world in different situations. There are many migrants also in detention who may be at risk of catching the disease, et cetera. So there are huge demands for data on migration related to COVID-19 that we perhaps didn't have a few months ago or these, we did have, that these demands have increased. Now, the second point I want to make is the global compact on migration starts with a call for to improve data on migration. It was already recognized before this crisis that countries lacked a capacity to collect good and timely data on migration around the world. So we already knew that um, uh, there was a need for better data on migration. Now, with this crisis, um, the d demands have increased, but the capacities of countries to actually collect this information have actually become more complicated and more challenging. Um, one of I, I uh, in addition to being the director of GIMDAC, I'm also the co-chair of the UN expert group on migration statistics. And uh, the co-chair of that group who, who, from South Africa, Diego Iteralda, um, published a short article with us yesterday uh, reporting on the difficulties that statistics South Africa is facing today because uh, it cannot collect data on migration in the traditional ways that it employed before this crisis uh, took place. And we have heard from many different agencies around the world and countries about the challenges that countries are facing. The national statistical offices are finding it uh, difficult to collect data in the, the normal ways that they might uh, have done so. We've heard about censuses being delayed in certain countries um, surveys being halted, face-to-face -face field work being interrupted, etc. So we have this increasing demand for data on migration related to COVID-19, and we have a situation where national statistical offices are finding it difficult to collect data in the traditional ways. So what can be done in this area? Well, I think IOM is very much focused on these challenges. And uh, our center is just one part of a big response that IOM is, is making in this area. So let me just mention a few things that we are doing at the Data Analysis Center. And I know that my colleague Nuno Nunes will talk much more about the work that we're doing together uh, with the DTM colleagues. So first of all, one of the, one of the things that we've seen and I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of this, is that every day now there are numerous articles written about this issue, COVID-19 and migration. We're being swamped with information on this subject. And one of the things we've tried to do is to, through our global migration data portal, make better sense of this information and create a dedicated space um, 
specifically looking at all the information and data on COVID-19 and migration. So we built what we call a new thematic page on our migration data portal, and you can uh, look for information there. I don't have time to give you some of the statistics that you can find there. A second thing that we're doing within the UN expert group on migration statistics is we are going to conduct a trial survey with some of the statistical offices who are members of our group. Uh, 21 countries are, are members of the group currently from different regions of the world. And uh, we're going to ask them about the uh, challenges that they're currently facing uh, from the perspective of a national statistical office in collecting data on migration uh, following the uh, onset of the crisis. The third thing that we're doing is that it's clear that a lot of the data will not, will not be produced in a timely fashion by the public sector, by national governments. We have to, we live in a different age today where um, the private sector is generating a lot of information about our mobility. Now, of course, there are concerns about data protection and privacy, but we haven't, as policymakers and practitioners, fully tapped into this potential of using the data that arises from the private sector to understand better um, what is the impact of COVID-19 on migrants around the world. And um, we're currently um, discussing with a number of institutes in Germany some pilot projects that we might do in this area. Fourthly, um, under this heading, I want to mention our work on gathering data on policies. It's important to monitor policy responses around the world in, in response to COVID-19. And we have an initiative called the Migration Governance Indicators Project, which IOM launched uh, three years ago, which collects data from more than uh, 70 countries around the world. And within the framework of that project, we're going to be asking additional questions about how countries are responding to COVID-19 and how they're changing their policies in response to uh, the pandemic. And then lastly, um, I want to mention that yesterday um, we issued a special uh, publication. Uh, it's called Migration Policy Practice. It's our bi-monthly journal. Um, and the special issue was devoted to the topic of COVID-19 and its implications for global migration. It includes 10 new articles about this subject. There are articles on data in particular from our research unit in Geneva, from the DTM colleagues in London and Geneva and around the world, and also from GIMDAC colleagues. So I encourage all of you to have a look at that. I've probably gone over my five to seven minutes, I'm not sure, but uh, Perhaps I'll stop there. Maybe one last word. Since David is on the panel and chairing this, we have to talk about the SDGs. Two or three months ago, the UN started 2020 saying, this is going to be the decade of action. We need to accelerate action so that we um, work towards achieving the SDGs. Now it looks like it's going to be increasingly difficult to achieve some of those migration related SDGs. Um, there are real risks that many migrants could be increasingly left behind as a result of this pandemic. But the problem is that we will, may not be able to fully document how far they're being left behind because we don't have the data to do so. Thank you. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, and uh, thank you for outlining those specific initiatives which uh, IOM is either has either launched or is involved in 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 the data field and for making that wider point about the SDGs. Um, it's now my great pleasure to ask uh, Nuno Nunes, who is a colleague of Fangs uh, at IOM, the global coordinator for DTM for the uh, displacement tracking uh, uh, matrix. Uh, Nuno, you are very very welcome. Uh, please speak to us. Uh, thank you very much, David, and uh, uh, thank you, colleagues, also for the invitation to be here. I'll try to share my PowerPoint just now. Okay. 
Could you just signal me if uh, you're able to see it? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, uh, sometimes I go too fast into uh, assuming that uh, colleagues uh, know about uh, DTM. Uh, so I thought that it would be good to give some statistics from last year. We are a network and of programs inside IOM uh, that uh, in 2019 uh, tracked uh, population needs and movements uh, of around 71.3 million people across uh, 78 countries. Um, and we have like 6,170 uh, data collectors, a network of 400 technical experts and key informants. So um, these uh, capacities allowed us to uh, quickly collect uh, information uh, through our networks, and which is mostly available in three websites. I'll repeat them at the end. Um, through this work, uh, aside from our regular activities uh, that uh, mostly relate to tracking uh, internal displacement uh, needs, conditions in which people are living and which have been adjusted now to uh, provide more information related to COVID-19, um, we also had uh, flow monitoring. And right now, uh, since almost uh, two months ago, uh, we deployed uh, different models, once on travel restrictions, one on points of entry, um, an impact on migrants and impact on IDPs. And I'll take you through that. The travel restrictions uh, for which we used uh, mostly data from IATA, but also from other internal sources, uh, have been somehow categorized by our teams into different uh, sets of uh, restrictive measures, uh, some related to um, health measures, visas, uh, uh, or uh, uh, just a, a ban on a total ban on movement, either based on nationality or based on views. Um, uh, the diagrams can be uh, found. Uh, I think this I selected this slide as an interesting comparison between how we saw uh, movements uh, evolving since the 9th of March until now, and we are having now. Uh, discussions uh, with colleagues from immigration and border management and migration health on how to uh, reassess the categories according to which we uh, tag uh, this information, including on assuming that we are at the point where uh, restrictions are almost at the maximum and what we will probably see from now uh, would be the emergence of uh, some sort of uh, possible solutions or uh, issues that the countries might uh, replicate. Um, we published like a public um, uh, report uh, on this it's on our website uh, every two days, I believe. And I have a video that I don't know if um, it will play well in your screens, but that's somehow uh, intended to show uh, that evolution. I don't think it's playing, so I'll skip this for now. It's a very interesting uh, when it plays. It's a very interesting uh, diagram. So this uh, uh, note that uh, we we did not start, what we are tracking are not restrictions uh, that already existed pre-COVID. Um, there was movement that was not possible between the two countries. Uh, this matrix is just showing uh, restrictions uh, that have been imposed post-COVID. Now. Uh, second uh, work stream relates to points of entry. For that one, uh, we use the wide, uh, the very broad network of IOM offices and contracts and um, conducted in this past month the assessment of uh, 2,950 points of entry uh, in 172 countries or territories around the world. Uh, the information collected. Uh, ranges from uh, border management procedures uh, to uh, uh, specific health-related uh, uh, initiatives and capacities uh, in these points. Covers. Uh, I thought I had the number of airports, but I don't. But many airports around the world, uh, many uh, and uh, borders. Uh, what we found uh, last week was that 40% of uh, uh, these total uh, points of entry assessed uh, were uh, closed, completely closed. 
um, and 13% were completely open and all the rest uh, was somewhere in between. And that uh, will be uh, reflected in one of uh, the reports that we also have online. Uh, a third work stream relates to impacts on migrants. So we thought uh, first, uh, uh, and we thought, I mean, uh, inside IOM together with uh, many specialists across the different divisions uh, that uh, we would need to track first uh, restrictive measures at international level. Uh, restrictive measures at internal level to assess the impact on internal mobility, um, uh, the situation at points of entry, uh, including now with more specialized assessments uh, from uh, uh, border management, migrant protection, and other colleagues, and then uh, an overall assessment of the impact on migrants. Uh, this one I'm not able to share with you is an internal document. Uh, it's very sensitive for us like to try to put together updates on a daily basis right now uh, where it says country A has uh, implemented certain measure and migrants from country B in that country are in a bad situation. And uh, we have tracked uh, in our database around 3 million people in cases. So, and these are nothing, I believe, the, the overall uh, uh, Impacts, uh, but are are somehow uh, documented. Uh, uh, these cases reach us uh, through different networks. Uh, some of them uh, we have support from uh, Amazon in uh, trying to make a, a web crawling of uh, news uh, related to uh, impact on migrants. We had difficulties in I think for data specialists uh, in creating a taxonomy of the types of problems that we would be willing to assess uh, and identify. And we also have information that comes to us through our uh, internal networks uh, through different IOM systems that we can use. Um, previous to this crisis, we were uh, working on uh, flow monitoring in a very broad uh, uh, geographical area, uh, assessing uh, how mobility was evolving and what were the patterns uh, in certain flow monitoring points, we continue to do that. And uh, a lot of this information that I've mentioned so far is also uh, shared with the uh, WHO and other groups. Uh, last one, the impact on IDPs. Uh, this one is public. Uh, it has been published uh, last week. Uh, overall, we are seeing, we saw last week, first uh, officially reported case in an IDP camp. So uh, previous to that, we saw cases reported in refugee and migrant camps in uh, IDP locations. Uh, we didn't have that so far, oh, sorry, in IDP contacts, not in IDP Somali. Um, we are monitoring restrictions of movement, uh, problems related to evictions, uh, conditions in which uh, inside uh, more congested locations and also the mitigation measures that are being used. Um, the map that I'm showing uh, here uh, are, is uh, you know, an area that covers Central African Republic, uh, South Sudan, Ethiopia, etc. And all these dots were locations that we were already assessing through our network of deployments and for which we are trying to also um, the evolution of the situation. Um, I would stop here. Uh, the, for any contacts, uh, we have the, this email address, DTM Provisional, and also the website uh, where most of the information that is public. Sorry, I went a bit over. No, thank you very much for that. Um, there's a lot to absorb, and uh, uh, attendees will have an opportunity to put questions to Nuno uh, later on and then the question and answer session. And uh, I now have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Rory Brewer, who is the director of the Irish Global Health Network, based uh, here in Dublin at the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, and Rory will analyze current COVID-19 data and the limitations of such data. Rory, over to you. Thank you, David. And while Owen is pulling up my slides there, I'm coming at this from a public health and an epidemiology perspective, um, looking at uh, what should we be measuring, maybe also what not to measure, and what can we learn from the data. 
So Owen is uh, in the process of pulling up my slides and I'll just start talking to the first one there. Um, uh, it's the most important slide. It's about what to measure. And the first thing you're going to see is measure the virus. So that's the title. We'll move on. This is the one. Thanks, Owen. So uh, the, the, the virus is measured through taking swabs of the nose back of the throat. And this is the cornerstone of uh, COVID-19 control. Testing for this is time consuming and it has been limited by the availability of testing equipment and shortages and shortages of reagents because this has become quite a, a competitive global market. Those countries who are doing virus testing in large numbers of people are usually the ones who are successfully controlling the virus and are in a position to keep the virus down. Second point there, antibody tests. Uh, so, now, they identify those people who have been exposed to the virus. However, evaluations of the tests developed to, to date is that they are not adequate in terms of sensitivity and specificity, which means they can miss uh, those with antibodies and they can uh, detect antibodies where they're not there at all. Uh, and another problem with them is that it has not been determined what the presence of antibodies mean. Uh, does it mean that a person is protected against further infection? That is not yet clear. Therefore, WHO is not recommending relying on antibody testing for, for understanding the epidemic in, in a population. However, the science evolves week by week, even day by day, and these may become uh, important over the next few weeks. I know there are uh, tests going on in Germany at the moment. Third thing to measure are the population characteristics of those being tested and those not being tested. So typically undocumented migrants in non-camp settings may miss out on being tested. However, uh, if, if you have a, a more of a captive population in, in, in a camp setting, you may be in a better position to carry out tests if, if you actually have the equipment and the reagents. Knowing the population characteristics of those who were reported as test positives will give you an insight into the nature of the epidemic. Fourthly, it's numbers that are important. Numbers of cases, numbers of new cases per day. Numbers, uh, uh, population incidence, that's the number in a defined population, be it a country or a camp setting, or a target group tells you the severity of the outbreak in that population. And numbers relate to the fifth point at the bottom there, health service capacity. As you are probably all aware, uh, the, the measures we use to control COVID-19 are distancing, closures and lockdowns. And one of the three reasons for those is to ensure uh, and protect health service capacity, capacity, which means critical care intensive care surge capacity. So you do need to measure the availability of uh, not only the facilities, the staff, and that is often what is missing. You, one thinks what, if one can supply the oxygen, uh, ventilators may be more difficult. Without trained staff, they're, they, they're not uh, of much use to you. So next slide, Owen. So that, as I said, I think is the most important slide. And the next slide that Owen is gonna pull up now is, um, what do we learn from trends uh, in cases and deaths? So first, uh, we, we measure what numbers of case positives in a population. And that uh, is determined by two things, the size of the epidemic, of course, but also the number of tests being carried out. Uh, secondly, we measure deaths. However, this is even, this is more of a problem because uh, the numbers of uh, COVID-19 deaths reported by countries depends on how they are counted and where they are counted. So typically the UK hasn't been counting nursing home deaths uh, as COVID-19 related. Um, and whereas Belgium, on the other hand, has counted all probable deaths, both in hospitals and in nursing homes as COVID-19 related. So the UK has underestimated its deaths and Belgium has overestimated its deaths. So um, uh, no two countries seem to be counting the deaths in the same way. Uh, you see here uh, in, in the, uh, the the table at the bottom there, you see case fatality rates. However, they, they can ra range from maybe up to 20, 25% down to below 1%. And, and they don't, what they reflect more than anything else is the level of testing again. 
So uh, the third thing then here is, is the number of tests carried out uh, in a population. It actually is a good indicator of COVID control. Ireland, uh, up to the 22nd of April, had the highest 14-day incidence of, of, uh, of COVID-19 reported. And that was because we were good at testing. There's a link there you might find useful, and uh, Owen is going to put it up there for people to look at. And uh, it, it shows that those countries that are actually very poor at testing, uh, less than 30 tests per million, are often the ones who are doing really badly in COVID control. Turkey being an example, where there's clearly a major migrant uh, problem. Iran and Brazil is, is appallingly low. And then in the table there, you see trends. So the trends reporting uh, cases over a period of time do give you an idea of where on the epidemic the country is. China's uh, epidemic uh, it appears to be over. South Africa, Indonesia at an early point in the epidemic. Uh, and Malawi, like uh, quite a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, is, is reporting very few cases. But it does appear that the epidemic hasn't really hit Africa in a big way. The next slide. The last two slides are kind of more the uh, just the icing on, on the cake. Uh, here, we're just looking at reproductive rates. And the concept of that is that uh, if a person is infected under natural conditions, how many other people will be affected? Uh, infected. And uh, on the right there, you see in the absence of control measures, uh, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, as it's called, one person will infect on average four, three to four people who will infect an, a, a similar number up to 16, up to 56. It's the infectivity of, of COVID-19 is, is almost as great as for measles, much greater than for uh, influenza. And that is what the control measures are trying to do. Is they're trying to bring that reproductive rate down. What use is this? If you, if, you, if you have data, you can start to model, you can start to actually show what is the, the potential uh, of, of an epidemic to cause harm in, in your community, in your target group of interest. Let's look at the next slide. And here we just look at some uh, epidemic curves. Again, modeling, uh, I always thought of it as a rather abstruse science because I don't understand it myself. But actually, the models that have been developed have shown to be a good indicator of uh, how the epidemic might develop. And even more important, they have been a very useful advocacy tool. And it has been the power of the models, those curves, we've been seeing them on our TV every night, flattening the curve or pushing it down, as Mike Ryan says. Uh, these are, are what help actually alert decision makers. So th they're the main messages I wanted to give you. Everything falls back to data. And as Mike Ryan of WHO said, test, test, test. Be happy to pick up on some questions later. Great. Thank you very much, Rory. I mean, you, 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 you set out very clearly what COVID control must actually mean. And and the broad trends worldwide in terms of uh, infection rates and the, 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 the vital need for, for data which will enable us to do the modelling that you've been talking about in relation to specific communities like, like migrants, all extremely useful. Thank you very, very much, Roy. So we move on now to Dominic Senner, who is the Senior Regional Migration and Health Advisor with IOM uh, based in Brussels. Dominic, over to you. I will also say something before, uh, whilst um, uh, Owen is uh, bringing up my slides, which I believe. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers and um, uh, congratulations how nicely um, the, uh, the speakers all fit together. So I'm going to present a much broader view on, um, on uh, migrant health data. I want to put that into a wider context also of migration and health. Uh, not only COVID, but particularly, uh, of course, uh, to COVID, and look at some of the other uh, issues with that. And I'm very grateful uh, for Frank and for Nuno and uh, for Rory uh, to actually uh, talk about uh, the specifics. So, uh, so it's all coming nicely together. Uh, so uh, this is my title, Health Surveillance for COVID Amongst Refugees and Migrants. And next uh, slide, this is I Have No Conflict of Interest. Um, next slide. Um, so, um, why do we need um, better data and what do we need data on? Um, these are the next two slides that I'm going to present. Well, um, 
people differ in terms of their vulnerabilities of how well they do with the virus and how well um, uh, they, uh, uh, the, the outcomes are, but also how risky it is uh, for them uh, to transmit. Uh, so this biological vulnerabilities, we all know this. Uh, so age, for example, and comorbidities, those kind of things. Um, underestimated is environmental vulnerabilities. And for example, uh, population density, like you can experience in camp situations. Uh, and here are some of the uh, things in, uh, uh, denoted uh, from Greece um, are very important. Equally important are um, absence of, um, uh, for example, sinks, wash facilities, those kind of things. Uh, uh, and they matter, and we, I believe, should have better data on them in order to inform interventions. Um, cultural li linguistic limitations, they are very important um, uh, when it comes to migrants and refugees. Uh, socioeconomic disadvantage, and not least to say the entitlement, and also the access to healthcare, to care in, in total, but also the healthcare. These are good predictors for poorer outcomes and enhanced transmission risk, and there is an urgency to, of course, tackle them in order to tackle uh, not only for humanitarian uh, reasons, but also to tackle the epidemic. We know all that. Next slide, please. So um, what would we like to have in an ideal world? And I start from the left top corner. We'd like to have clinical data. So um, I love it that uh, basically uh, Rory has talked about um, um, uh, surveillance in a very, very nice uh, form and taking uh, quite a lot or explaining quite a lot about laboratory uh, surveillance and that kept, uh, could make for a very good uh, panel discussion um, later on uh, as well. I would argue that um, we have uh, in many uh, diseases like flu and or all others, uh, we have collected uh, symptoms. In, um, uh, we, in, in some of the uh, diseases, um, uh, this is actually quite essential. And we have done that, to be fair, uh, quite a lot in COVID. This is how we know that, for example, what are the classical uh, three symptoms. Um, but we um, have slightly neglected, I would argue, uh, something called syndromic surveillance, where we basically get a little bit more of a handle of, um, of wider, um, uh, sort of what's, what's the wider uh, um, syndro uh, syndromic, uh, what's the wider symptoms in the, uh, in the wider population. Equally, um, I go to the right. Um, um, of course, uh, migration health is not explainable without looking at the social determinants of health. And I did talk about um, living conditions, for example, camp-like situations. But I'd like to broaden this out because basically uh, there are uh, a smaller part of the um, vulnerable population. Um, as we all know, there's uh, very vulnerable populations as urban migrants and um, some, uh, and, and Frank very nicely uh, alluded to that, uh, stranded uh, migrants in uh, different places, uh, and of course those that have a, a regular status. Um, working conditions, uh, another very important thing. Why do we need to collect this? Because we don't know what to do, really, uh, because uh, we're left then with blunt instruments like locking everybody down. Um, but of course, uh, the, the more detailed data we have, the better we can uh, um, um, have interventions. Um, migration, I'm going to the bottom, isn't explainable without looking at uh, how migrants are differently affected. Uh, migration health is differently affected in different phases of the migration. There's the pre-migration phase, the movement phase, the arrival and integration phase, and the return phase, all of which are important and differently uh, um, uh, um, influence uh, the health of migrants, uh, and also the COVID transmission risk. And uh, thirdly, of course, uh, fourthly, of course, uh, the money. Next slide, please. So um, we are not in isolation, and I did want to uh, use this slide to point out um, there is uh, a lot of work. Uh, Elizabeth, later on in the program, will talk about, uh, um, I think, uh, some of the consensus building around harmonizing migration health data. There's an ongoing piece of work. One of the arguments that I wanted to make is that I think we should be drawing upon stuff that we already know and stuff that we've already been working on. So we're not in isolation. Um, as Frank alluded to, um, uh, these systems aren't uh, perhaps as readily available sometimes uh, at the moment because, uh, um, because um, uh, and, and uh, the irony has it that uh, data is getting scarcer um, on, on these aspects, but in principle they exist, population data uh, like census, labor force data, health service data, hospital, primary care, immigration data, detention records, visa records, passenger service, 
um, and uh, overlapping uh, categories. And then there is specific data, which are bespoke uh, health information systems at reception or post entry uh, level or emergency and NGO data, um, bespoke service research studies and big data. We all may know that, uh, for example, Google publishes on the um, uh, movement of people uh, uh, in relation to confinement measures. Um, and of course, uh, Nuno talked about the displacement tracking metrics. Next uh, slide, please. So all of these uh, data are there. Um, there are some huge, huge problems, uh, even at the best of times and even before COVID, uh, because they are not built for the purpose necessarily. And the question is, um, in many systems, we don't have migration markers. And in many systems, uh, the migration markers are too crude. So we don't know what that means. Um, as an example, not, not all migrants are the same. They're very heterogeneous population. And it's perhaps not so interesting to just know about that. The, um, the specific data is very time bound very often. Um, and the big data is often difficult to interpret. And there, in COVID, I think I would argue there is a big problem with the timeliness of all of these data. So whilst we would need uh, some of this, um, if we, it may not be available in real time. Next uh, slide, please. And then when we talk about um, migrants that are, for example, outside of camps, where it may be slightly more straightforward to determine det denominators, um, and we talk about um, urban uh, migrants, uh, etc. Denominators are a real challenge, and as we can all see, uh, denominators are important because uh, um, if we don't calculate them properly, we get wrong incidence rates, wrong mortality rates. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, I couldn't talk about migration health data which, without talking about some of the pitfalls. Migration health data is unique in the respect that it actually uh, connects somehow the border issue and the, uh, the home office issue with, uh, with health issues. Um, and so this has, as we all know, um, in the past led to some um, breaches and some incidents. There is also some good practice. If I put up here um, the source from PICOM, the firewall, so the separation between migration authorities and healthcare sector as one way of tackling those kind of issues. Um, and of course, uh, unfortunately, migration is uh, often political. So there is an interest uh, to uh, uh, even if um, we are very careful in interpreting the data, there may be uh, um, some bias included. Uh, next slide, please. But not all uh, hope is lost. So basically, we have uh, quite a lot even in this COVID outbreak. I'm coming back. Um, uh, um, there, a lot of work has happened. So basically, um, there is WHO guidance now uh, on uh, camp settings and um, and there's IACNC guidance um, on surveillance uh, in camps as well. There is still, I would argue, a gap in uh, um, about ref urban refugees, migrants with undocumented status, and the millions of people that are stranded. I wanted to point out a couple of documents here as well. Uh, so uh, one is um, from my friends uh, in WHO, the report on health of refugees and migrants. I'm sure that Elizabeth will talk about that later on. But also, I wanted to uh, say we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So there is actually, for example, a few years old uh, from ECDC a handbook on implementing syndromic surveillance. It's uh, similar documents from WHO. Next slide, please. So we have some help um, um, on how we can be doing. So what can we do? We can use established processes and procedures and build on them. Um, there's um, um, focused on pragmatic and doable things. Um, I did argue and I wanted to argue that syndromic surveillance in my view, in my view is underrated a little bit. Um, modalities, um, just to point out, there is uh, quite a lot of uh, things that we heard. Uh, so we, uh, um, we know that, for example, there is uh, the way to communicate directly with migrants, but also to take data um, from them. Um, I pointed out here the, the MIG app, but I also wanted to point out the electronic personal health record that was implemented uh, in uh, Southern Europe by IOM, um, as well as many other things that I put down here as well. And lastly, I wanted to point out that um, new, uh, as uh, uh, Rory has uh, so aptly put it, um, uh, new uh, stuff is emerging every day. So um, relatively new in COVID terms, actually an old hat, is uh, that uh, CAFIT has developed um, or redeveloped their gene expert machine, which was uh, for tuberculosis testing based on a cartridge system, a bit like a coffee machine. 
um, for COVID as well. And Abbott has done the same. And there is now about slightly less than 10 uh, um, um, that are doing those kind of things. We need to find algorithms and we need to find ways to integrate this into the uh, testing, but also to integrate that data into our surveillance systems is my argument. Next slide, please. And I wanted to uh, just end with this uh, sentence from my friend and point out, next slide, please, that um, uh, we have a migration health evidence portal now for COVID-19. And thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dominic. Um, uh, you, you've, you've shown very clearly um, the challenges in uh, gathering data on migrants' health, uh, and also the, the, you've emphasized the need to integrate that into testing systems and, and enable us to exploit that data to, to the fullest. I now turn to Monette Sard, who is the Director of the Programme on Forced Migration and Health at Columbia in New York. New York. Monette, you're very, very welcome. Please take the floor. Thank you so much, David. Um, so I'm going to just pull up slides here. Are these are not sophisticated slides, but um, they at least will give you a sense of where I'm going. So, thank you so much for the invitation today. I'm delighted to join you all and. Uh, to be here to talk with you about migrant behaviors and how these impact on the challenge of data collection and really thinking about the specific vulnerabilities of migrants in the context of the pandemic. Um, and so with, with that task in mind, I'd like to make three basic points, many of which have already been made in different ways by my colleagues. So first of all, um, I uh, would like to um, note that uh, in a world that has effectively tried to um, shut down mobility, um, uh, migration, we know from our own experience, continues. Um, more than 190 countries have imposed COVID-19 related travel restrictions and 3 billion people live in countries that have completely closed their borders to uh, foreigners. And while migration may be down, so IOM statistics, for example, have recorded a 28% decrease in migration flows uh, in West Africa in the first three months of this year uh, compared to last year's numbers. We know that people still continue to move and they move for the complex reasons that migrants have always moved. And frankly, the stark reality that conflicts don't stop because there's a pandemic. So this leads to particular concerns for migrants who are ending up stranded by lockdowns and in border regions. In West Africa alone, IOM has reported 10,000 migrants stranded at borders, mainly in Chad, Mauritania, Burkina Faso, and Niger, and aid organizations in Niger, which has been a longtime migration transit country, have really been uh, overwhelmed by requests for assistance from people who've become stuck when countries um, close their borders in West Africa. Uh, we also know that port closures and prohibitions on disembarkation have also stranded migrants at sea. And many of us have followed the horrific story of the two fishing trawlers with nearly 800 Rohingya refugees on board who've been crisscrossing the Bay of Bengal and the Andaman Sea trying to find a country that will take them in. Malaysia has already turned them away. Bangladesh says it won't take them back in, which means they're facing the very real prospect of starvation at sea. In the Mediterranean, Italy and Malta have also further restricted uh, the operation of rescue ships, making the crossing of the Mediterranean even more deadly than usual. Now, we know that in these transit and border zones, migrant mortality uh, rates are high, even without COVID. Um, the IOM's Missing Migrants Project has recorded more than 30,000 migrant deaths worldwide since starting to track deaths in 2014. But we know that this is likely an underestimate and there's a significant data gap there. Um, states don't regular, regularly collect, report or share data on migrant deaths and the quality of the data that we have is poor because it's not regularly disaggregated by sex, age, or country of origin. And we can assume 
that what we all know to be a data gap here has now become a chasm because of the lockdown uh, and travel restrictions, which means that even fewer national staff or humanitarian staff are on site in these border areas and able to record what is happening uh, or even to render assistance. So the second point that I'd like to make relates to issues of stigma and discrimination, which we've also touched on already in this call. We've seen in past pandemics, and unfortunately COVID is no different, that refugees and migrants are often the first to be stigmatized and unjustly blamed for the spread of disease. In the US, people of Asian uh, descent have been singled out and subjected to xenophobic attacks, and these sentiments have been fueled by rhetoric at the highest levels of government. Malaysia, just this last weekend, has rounded up and detained hundreds of migrants of refugees in the name of combating the virus, spreading fear throughout migrant communities. In India, we see COVID-19 adding fuel to the flame of anti-Muslim uh, xenophobia. Now, despite the desire for populist po politicians to continue making this assertion, there is no evidence to support this link. And from a public health perspective, from what we know from HIV and Ebola, for example, we know that stigmatizing the viral transmission only further places population at risk and reduces access to care because it pushes these communities further into the shadow, into the shadows and reduces their ability to seek care. The first line of defense we have in public health is people coming forward to disclose their symptoms um, and to seek testing and treatment. Um, and so, of course, we know that driving these communities into the shadow complicates our data gathering, it complicates our public health response. And we also know that these challenges are compounded by the fact that we have inequitable access to testing and treatment for migrant populations. Migrants, particularly undocumented migrants, have limited access to testing and care. And we know that many of them are extremely susceptible to infection because of their living conditions, living in congregate settings, in crowded urban or informal settlements, poor nutrition, or because of the type of work that they do. So ensuring that these communities have comprehensive access to prevention measures, as well as testing and treatment alongside other populations is absolutely critical. And this is especially important at a time when uh, personal protective equipment, testing resources, ventilators are scarce, and many countries are prioritizing the needs of their own citizens. Um, finally, it is critical that migrant communities feel safe um, coming forward um, to access treatment and to ask for treatment, which really requires that there be clear firewalls between health provision and immigration enforcement. One country leading by example is Portugal, which has granted non-citizens equal rights during the pandemic, including the right to health care. And we also see some positive examples <laughs> elsewhere, in Ireland and South Korea and elsewhere. But unfortunately, there are many, many uh, problematic examples as well. So all of that to say that these communities that we know are in the shadows need to be able to come forward, both so that we have accurate data and are better able to respond to their needs. So the third and final area that I wanted to touch on really relates to the indirect <coughs> impacts of the pandemic on migrant uh, and refugee health and well-being. We know, again, from our past experience and past epidemics, that as the international community directs all of its energies towards battling the novel coronavirus, that disruptions to supplies, disruptions to the travel of health personnel, and the upending of routine health services such as vaccinations will end up leading to many more deaths than COVID itself. During the 2014-2016 um, Ebola uh, epidemic, we saw deaths from measles, malaria, HIV and TB exceed deaths from Ebola. And today we're hearing anecdotal reports from colleagues in Lebanon, for example, who have reported uh, of people deferring uh, critical care, such as cancer treatments, because of a fear of contagion uh, in health facilities. We already are seeing the resurgence of Ebola in the DRC, disruptions to fighting cholera in Yemen, 
and so on. And our data is not adequately capturing some of these vulnerabilities. In New York, just recently, we've started really counting uh, the number of deaths and revising them upwards to incorporate deaths at home. But in other contexts, our data gathering is weaker and we run the risk of really not capturing these second order impacts adequately. So in conclusion, um, I'd like to leave you with um, some recommendations in these final slides. Uh, and really to say that we ignore the health and vulnerability uh, of uh, migrant communities at our peril. Um, and we only have to look at the example of Singapore, where the initial reports were all of a very effectively managed healthcare response to the pandemic. Uh, but then as the pandemic resurged and COVID resurged in Singapore, it became clear that the fact that migrant communities had essentially been ignored in that first level response and overlooked um, uh, led to a resurgence of the disease. And it can really illustrate how public health goals can be undermined if we fail to count the most invisible amongst us and to treat them uh, with dignity and respect so that they are willing to come forward. Uh, this pandemic is going to be a measure of the cost um, of governments that discriminate against migrants. Um, and we would do well to remember uh, that the health of one is the health of all. So this is my final set of recommendations. And with that, I think I'm going to hand it back to you, David. Thank you very much, Monet. Some very, very powerful points there. Um, and uh, I now move to uh, Dr. Katrina Dowd of Dublin City University. Katrina will speak to us a bit about the use of data in humanitarian settings. Katrina, over to you. Thank you, David, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to join you today. Um, I'll start by saying simply I'm not a public health expert, so it's a, it's a, a privilege to be on the, the panel with so many different perspectives and different areas of expertise, but my work focuses on the use of data in monitoring conflict and humanitarian crises. And I would emphasize that as much as this is a health crisis, it also has those political, social and economic dimensions as well which is what I'll speak to today in relation to humanitarian response. And I suppose just to start off by saying conflict complicates all kinds of data systems um, and everything that we try to collect and monitor and report on uh, in humanitarian response. The new humanitarian website just yesterday reported that an estimated 200,000 people have been displaced from their homes due to conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo's Ituri province, but that they're unable, aid groups are unable to verify those numbers because insecurity is blocking that verification and corroboration process. So just, I just raise that as one example of the very real tangible physical barrier created by conflict to gather data and estimate numbers at all before we even get into the discussion of uh, best practice and, and how we can really monitor effectively. And I think as Manette mentioned, conflicts don't stop because of pandemics. So against that backdrop, I'd like to talk about three key uh, key points. So uh, next slide, please, Owen. Thank you. And the first is that in um, the first point, please, thank you. The first is that in humanitarian contexts, I think it's really key that we broaden out this discussion from displaced people and, um, and migrants alone to talk about displacement affected populations and communities. In addition to the risks that we know and, and can intuitively understand exist for people who are displaced in, in camp or camp like settings uh, that are congested and, and low resourced, we also need to bear the following in mind, and that's urban displaced um, or those in non camp settings. Rory and Dominic already mentioned some of the difficulties around gathering data on, on groups in that in that category, but estimates suggest that the majority of people displaced worldwide fall into that category. Um, host populations also have particular needs. We may be focused on migrant and displaced populations in this conversation, but host populations are often hosting displaced populations because they are themselves economically, socially or politically marginalized. Um, and Dominic mentioned also some of the different migration phases. So I'd like to consider as well those who have been recently displaced, but who have returned. All of those groups face particular challenges and risks that can be compounded in this crisis. We need to be attentive in our data collection and our monitoring and our reporting that we're monitoring and collecting data across these different groups. Uh, first and foremost, to prevent there being gaps in our coverage and response that are underserving particular communities at risk. 
but also more broadly because to fail to understand those different impacts can contribute to the stigmatization and discrimination against displaced populations. Because of the nature of this pandemic, we need to do all we can to understand those differential needs, but respond in ways that do not contribute to that stigmatization or the othering of displaced populations. And that leads me to my, my second point. Um, thanks. And you can move along to the second point. Thanks, Owen. Thank you. That Which is that we need to be mapping wider social tensions and also protection threats. It's important that we're responsible, we're responsive and sensitive to those divisions, but also connections within and across groups. And by that, I mean that we need to be drawing on existing social tensions mapping, which is a practice we're seeing integrated more and more into humanitarian response and context analysis, pooling resources on this across humanitarian agencies and drawing on secondary sources where we can, but also continuing to monitor how those tensions and divisions evolve as those wider social and political processes evolve too. We need to be conflict sensitive in our response and in our data collection and make sure that we're not responding in ways that reinforce or exacerbate social tensions. I think with that in mind, we need to be mindful that there are already things that we're not doing particularly well or where we have gaps in in terms of humanitarian data collection and response. Chief among those that, that strikes me as particularly uh, pertinent is gender based violence. That's an area we simply don't have even prior to the crisis. Good, consistent, reliable data in many contexts. What we do have is a lot of reasons to believe that those threats to women and, and to, to people within a household can increase in the context of the current pandemic. Uh, that's not unique to migrant populations or displaced populations, but we need to be aware that factors associated with restricted movement, with lockdown, with reduced humanitarian and protection services being provided to displaced populations, and also isolation can compound those. And I think what I'd like to emphasize is that we can't to design and deliver conflict and gender sensitive responses unless we're mapping those wider risks and also those wider tensions. There are very real consequences if we don't that are, as sort of has been mentioned already, that those sort of second order or wider consequences can be equally deadly, can be equally dangerous, if not more so than a pandemic itself. Um, and I think not only is there a risk that we could exacerbate conflict, the perception that some groups are being served more or more effectively than others, uh, there's a risk that we that will make us unable to reach those who are particularly vulnerable and therefore our response won't be effective. But we can also see attacks on health personnel and health responders themselves or those going to collect the data that we need to monitor and, and respond effectively. And we've seen similar dynamics in our in DRC Ebola response, for example, and that will only compound and further underserve communities. And the reason I highlight these first two points first around thinking about displacement affected communities, but secondly, around wider social tensions mapping is because many operational organizations will right now be deciding what is critical, what is essential data collect and they will to collect and they will rightly be limiting their data collection at the moment to what's essential and critical in order to protect communities and to protect their staff. And that's an incredibly important and, and valid thing to do. But I would argue and really want to, to implore humanitarian organizations to consider the mapping of these protection risks and to consider displacement affected populations beyond displaced groups alone as part of that critical data that needs to be collected. And the third point I want to make is just in relation to data systems. They need to be coordinated, but also really critically, they need to center crisis affected populations. We are seeing even in better resourced health systems the way that people call into question the veracity of data and reporting. We need to keep in mind that in humanitarian contexts, that sort of trust in public authority, that trust in figures and expertise and data is, is characterized by a breakdown of social trust between crisis affected populations and authorities, and even in some cases, humanitarian responders, and a perception often that their needs, their priorities and their capacities aren't part of that conversation. And we see that when we see designs kind of top down um, or one size fits all responses. There's very little to tell people who are at the heart of these crises that their needs and what they are prioritizing is part of that discussion. So we need to consider three things and that's consistent, reliable uh, information management. And 
and, and data collection. And we won't have time to get into all of that here, but perhaps this is something we can touch on in the in the wider Q&A. There are contexts in which we already cannot collect humanitarian information because humanitarian access prior to this crisis was restricted or prevented entirely. So we need to be mindful of the fact that that's an existing barrier that's only going to be compounded further. We need to have collective buy-in about the data that's being reported because we already see in context with fragmented authority, places where you have non-state and state control, for example, of territory that reports, figures, news, information coming out of a, a competing authority's territory can be politicized or discredited. Management of misinformation is incredibly important and there's good practice here from humanitarian organizations that are working with peace building groups, for instance, to look at rumor management and misinformation, addressing that and correcting misperceptions. But the last point I want to end on is that good data systems are not a one-way extractive process and the tendency, particularly in crisis response, is to emphasize data collection, gathering and reporting upwards. We need to make sure that we feedback loops that are feeding back to communities so that precisely that point that Manette made, that people feel comfortable coming forward, that they feel safe coming forward, that they believe that coming forward is in their own interests, sharing that information is in their own interests. And lastly, that they believe, not just that they're told, but that their priorities are at the center of that response. So I have three recommendations on my final slide that just touch on those. Um, and that's around displacement effect to communities, the need to look at that wider social tension mapping, and finally, to really center those, those communities in any data system so that it's a loop rather than a, rather than a pipeline. Thanks so much. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much, Katrina. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, and so our final speaker, and apologies, Elizabeth, for reaching you uh, at the end, is Elizabeth Wagonson, who is with WHO, dealing with migration and health issues. Uh, Elizabeth, you're very welcome. Please take the floor. Thank you very, very much. And, and let me start first by also thanking uh, the IOM and GEMDAC for including us in this uh, conference today. Thank you very much indeed. So um, I don't know, Owen, are you able to put up my slides? That would be wonderful. Otherwise, I will try and, uh, and, and pull them up. But um, very quickly, I would just like to start with a, a quick overview of the uh, region that uh, we cover in the European uh, Office um, of the WHO uh, with regards to migration and health. So uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we cover 53 member states uh, from the regional office in Europe, which is around 920 million people in the region. And of that, approximately 10% uh, of the population is uh, considered a migrant, which amounts to some uh, 96 million people that we serve. And of these, 7% uh, are uh, refugees and asylum seekers. And the definitions that we use within our program and the publications that we have is um, based on the UNHCR for the uh, definition of refugee and asylum seekers, and on the IOM definition of migrant, which is a very uh, broad definition um, and, uh, and what we work with uh, with regards to uh, refugee and migrant health. We don't work with uh, IDPs, we deal mainly with uh, international migrants, so people that cross country borders. Um, and we uh, rarely uh, also comment on other uh, minority groups, for example, or, or other vulnerable populations, although uh, we do, of course, see an overlap of uh, refugees and migrants within those groups. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, just to have a very, very short uh, sort of overview of the uh, of the, the migration and, and, and regional agenda, which I'm sure all of you are keenly aware. So um, the European region was the first region within WHO to develop um, and uh, agree on a regional strategy and action plan for the health of refugees and migrants. Um, and after that, the uh, global action plan was later developed and, and agreed to uh, last year at the World Health Assembly. Um, the regional strategy and action plan is, uh, is special in this sense that we have uh, it associated with indicators as well. And um, the, the strategy and action plan is nine priority areas of which uh, priority area nine, in fact, is improving health information and communication under which uh, uh, and core indicator four is the uh, indicator. And there are five indicators associated with this 
uh, strategy action plan. And for this, uh, it indicates its inclusion of migration status variable in existing data sets in our 53 member states. Now, we did a, a progress report on the uh, strategy and action plan in 2018, and we've just uh, completed the second progress report on the implementation of this uh, action plan, including, of course, a on the uh, indicators and uh, in the bottom right hand corner you'll see a box with the 2020 progress report um, we've had 35 member states of the 53 that have managed to get back to us with uh, results this year in the first round of uh, the progress report it was 40 member states now of course there may be uh, a number of different reasons why uh, member states are not able to uh, hand back their uh, surveys. Uh, I highly suspect that uh, the uh, intense um, effort with regards to COVID-19 has, has sort of put a little bit of a, of a break on, on what member states are able to, uh, to send to us at the moment. But um, the main sources of, uh, of data or health information that, that member states uh, are able to, uh, to to, to sort of provide is population-based records uh, and medical and utilization records, and of course also health uh, interview surveys seem to be the, uh, the sort of the predominant uh, areas of data collection that is being used in member states. Then we have, of course, the uh, United Nations Global Compact on Migration and the Global Compact uh, for Refugees. And thank you also for mentioning uh, those earlier. Of course, the Global Compact for Migration has also been uh, Extremely important in the UN network for migration, um, of which there's a, a very big uh, piece of work uh, going on at the moment, also specifically uh, targeted towards uh, COVID-19 and the response to that, um, which is uh, a very important and, and interesting uh, collaboration that shows the complexity of migration health, which takes into account, as uh, Katrina and many of the other speakers highlighted, that this is uh, to do with social determinants of health. It's uh, regarding the whole of society and it's uh, although we deal with health we see the the implications of the social determinants of health um, at, at a very specific uh, level when we talk about migration and health and then of course the sustainable development goals which was also mentioned at the very beginning uh, so it's a nice sort of uh, rounding up of uh, of the speakers here we are, of course, concerned with the uh, with reaching the uh, sustainable development goals as we move forward. But on the other hand, I have to say we we are very uh, hopeful that this will be an opportunity to build back better, if we can use that uh, used expression, um, and also that the the implications of COVID nineteen and and the uh, data collection, as well as many other policy recommendations and our recommendations about mainstreaming refugee and migrant health international health systems may indeed be um, a very welcome um, uh, opportunity. If I could ask for the next slide, please. So um, when we did the, uh, the first round of, of data collection on the implementation of the uh, strategy and action plan, several uh, different uh, aspects of data collection were um, identified as, as challenges. So first of all, it's, it was a lack of scientifically valid and comparable migrant data throughout the European region that we saw. There was a huge um, variation from different uh, parts of the region with regards to not only the amount of uh, data research being done on the area, but also the types of, uh, of data being, uh, being collected. Then we saw a lack of data specifically on vulnerable groups such, such as uh, irregular migrants and a lack of data that was disaggregated by sex or gender, migration status and exit calls. And then a lack of data on the overall health status of refugees and migrants, not only on specific diseases. Many times what we saw was data that we could find available in specific disease registries but uh, we rarely have the opportunity look, to look at the complete health status of refugees and migrants. And so for that reason, we, we also compiled uh, the report that Dominic mentioned earlier, which is the report on the health of refugees and migrants in the WHO European region. Now that's a, a compilation of uh, almost or more than 13,000 pieces of uh, literature to give a um, uh, a look, a status report on not only the causes and the consequences uh, of, uh, of refugee and, and migrant health, but also the responses that 
are available within the region and that we see uh, being implemented ac across the region. Uh, it's also an opportunity for us to uh, identify the gaps that exist within refugee and migrant health in our region. And, and thirdly, the opportunity to investigate and improve data collection and availability. And exactly the availability of and, and data uh, on refugees and migrants uh, caused us to, uh, to further investigate this. And we commissioned the, uh, the HEN 66. Now HEN is a health evidence network report. Um, and this particular one was concerned with the evidence on availability and integration of refugee and migrant health data in health information systems in the WHO European region. And again, this is the 53 member states of our region. Um, this was a HEN report that uh, was uh, very well received and uh, it shows the differences across the region again on the availability and data uh, types and main sources. It shows uh, that data integration was often limited. Health monitoring surveys and data linkage approaches were underused uh, in general. And the policy uh, considerations that came out of that uh, report or was proposed through that report was a harmonization of uh, migrant uh, definitions. It's an uh, obstacle that we often run into in our field of work. What is a migrant? Who's included? Who's not included, et cetera. Uh, promoting uh, the coordination and the governance of data collection, as has been mentioned uh, earlier, and then uh, performance monitoring for health information systems um, as well. We also uh, recommend in this report uh, promoting cross-country exchange of experiences, as was mentioned before, um, not only best practice experiences for, for healthcare, but certainly also for data collection on refugees and migrants. Um, and then exploiting data linkages that may be available um, and then expanding existing health surveillance uh, activities that are already uh, implemented in member states and reducing healthcare barriers and strengthening uh, general health information systems as well. Um, the, uh, the, the launch of this report happened at the PETCH uh, consensus conference last year. Um, which was a, a health conference uh, that was uh, put in place or, or hosted by one of our collaborating centers. And there's an outcome statement online if, for those that are interested. Um, through this uh, consensus uh, conference, the uh, follow-up task force was also established. This is uh, a, a voluntary working group with experts that uh, look at data collection and indicators for migration and health. And uh, the idea is that we are currently developing a technical guidance on data collection that looks at both uh, taxonomy, taxonomy sorry, and definitions, um, data collection methods and, and categories, uh, et cetera. So this is a technical guidance that we hope to, uh, to see uh, in, the, in the next uh, sort of six to eight months. Um, and the last slide, please, thank you. So with regards to COVID-19 specifically, uh, there are two currently two ways that member states can report uh, COVID-19 cases to the WHO in general. One is a case-based uh, reporting uh, approach and the other is aggregated week, uh, weekly case reporting. The case-based uh, reporting, uh, as you can see, I've just taken a small snapshot of one of the small sections of the, uh, of the form that uh, member states are asked to fill out is uh, disaggregated by uh, age, um, the sex at birth of the, of the patient, and then the place where the uh, case was diagnosed, and if this is the usual place of residency. Now, these are the only uh, indicators that we have that are specifically uh, disaggregating the data in, in that regard. And then there's the aggregated uh, weekly case reporting of which uh, only age and sex is uh, disaggregated within that data set. And this, of course, uh, reflects the, the huge amount of, the, of case reporting that has been done by member states uh, in, in some countries and the, the lack of capacity in order to do uh, individual case reporting is, is completely understandable. Um, so we do see a lot of aggregated uh, weekly case reporting. As cases go down again, we hope to gather, of course, more um, disaggregated data again. I've included the links to, to those two um, uh, pieces um, on our uh, global uh, website. And in, in general, for those that are interested, you can go into the WHO 
uh, headquarters website and see all of the technical uh, guidances that are available there. Um, I also want to mention, because Dominic mentioned it earlier, the use of uh, surveillance. Uh, we have the Sentinel surveillance sites that we usually use for influenza um, surveillance uh, and also the SARI, which is the um, severe acute respiratory infection surveillance that happens at hospital level, of course. So with all this taken into account, which is the general uh, data collection that happens during COVID-19, what, what can we suggest from the Migration and Health Programme? Well, what we've suggested so far is to include two uh, data points as well for our uh, member states uh, to report back to us um, through our focal points or uh, WRs, which is WHO representatives in member states. And one of them is just a number of uh, cases reported in the record migrant community, which uh, they are aware of, so that we have more of a, uh, an official uh, pipeline of, of information coming in. And then also um, uh, the policies or other measures that are implemented during COVID-19 that have a direct impact on, on refugees and migrants. Of course, a lot of work is being done by many different agencies that look at uh, policies implemented during COVID-19. And we, of course, particularly interested in those that uh, affect health and migrants at the same time. We are currently uh, compiling this uh, and hope to do a policy review um, of the region of the, the different uh, policies that have been implemented during this uh, pandemic. Um, and hopefully we will be able to provide uh, not only an update internally to our colleagues, but also in the long run, this will be for our research uh, activities. Finally, I'd like to just mention that uh, we've been through uh, the response phase now in which we've seen um, high numbers of, of infection, of course, in our, um, and as we move into the recovery phase, it's important uh, even more so perhaps to have uh, comparable, timely and available data um, that, we, that we will be able to use in addressing the health needs of refugees and migrants, not only during the pandemic, but also uh, for inclusion uh, of them into uh, national health systems, which is what we uh, promote uh, in general from our program side, that uh, recognizing that all facets of migrant uh, health uh, needs to be addressed, uh, not only during the pandemic, but of course uh, in the uh, general approach to, to refugee and migrant health. And this uh, is also uh, evident during the pandemic when we look at non-communicable diseases, mental health, and chronic diseases that are uh, not to be neglected as we, uh, as we focus on fighting the uh, coronavirus. So on the final slide, please, on. I've included uh, a link to uh, all of the publications. It's uh, maybe a little bit unclear to see, and I hope this will be included in the final report uh, from this uh, conference. But uh, on that website, you can go in and find all of our uh, Applications that are available at the moment, reports, can reports, technical guidances, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much for my side, and I'm sorry if I went over. There is uh, so much to say and a uh, little time. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. There's a lot to say, but you, 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 you covered some very, very interesting ground there, uh, and, and we're very grateful. It was a very useful indication of the channels which already exist to inform the WHO or to, about uh, uh, data related to migrants and refugees, and uh, um, I, I found that particularly interesting. So um, that completes our, our list of presentations. Um, we've gone a little bit over time, but um, uh, uh, we thought that we would go ahead with a short interactive um, session among the speakers and I would encourage attendees who would like to ask questions, put comments, give responses. Uh, I, I, I would like, I would encourage them to do that now uh, so that we can use the time we have left, which is approximately uh, 30 minutes. So um, really just to sort of kick off the, um, the, the session, uh, our collective session among the speakers, I mean, if I were to try to draw a thread uh, from the various um, presentations we've had so far. I mean, most, most of us seem to be saying that data are, uh, on, on migrants uh, and refugees and asylum seekers are, are needed in the first instance to ensure that 
these vulnerable communities are integrated within national health systems, within the healthcare specifically geared to, to COVID-19. Um, this is necessary from a, a humane uh, point of view. It, it's necessary to ensure that these communities are not uh, forgotten about, they're not left out, uh, and that they get full access to services at this critical time. They also are vulnerable uh, because of the immediate risks to their health, perhaps greater than for many of the rest of us. They are vulnerable because of collapsing economic opportunities, because of a lack of social uh, supports. And in, in, in many countries, this will just happen over time. It's, it, it's, it's, it, it won't be finished when lockdowns uh, are lifted. It, it, it is a, a, a medium term um, set of pressures. So data, therefore, there are very practical needs for data which will demonstrate that these communities uh, have urgent needs and they must be met uh, by countries as they plan their overall uh, COVID-19 responses. There's also a point which um, Ness and others made about the need to combat the um, xenophobic uh, uh, reactions we're seeing in various places, or at the very least, populist reactions, um, which try to stigmatize migrants as, uh, in some cases, the the source of the virus, and, and at the very least, not deserving of the same treatment as everybody else. Um, I thought that that argument came across very, very strongly. So, in a way, um, can I just perhaps to, to throw the ball in, as we would say, could I ask Monette if she feels able to comment about um, the stigmatization aspect in the country she's living in at present? Uh, I mean, we all know where much of the pressure is coming from, but in a more positive vein, is there what can be done at the sub-national level, at the level of cities and, and states, to try to um, correct this stigmatization? I mean, I offer, I, I introduced that topic really just to start a kind of wider discussion about the point uh, around health being uh, health for all and not just for, for, for some. So, um, Owen, can you bring in Monette if she's, if she's available there just to launch the discussion? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And um, thank you to all my fellow panelists also for such a rich uh, set of presentations. Um, in terms of how do you tackle this issue of stigma and xenophobia, I think the first point that I would make here is just the importance of access to information and not just any information, science based information. And that's what is, uh, you know, um, critically important across the globe, but that is also what is proving a challenge in the US specifically, that there is a uh, uh, sometimes a misalignment between uh, the political agenda of people driving the public health response and the scientists and the public health experts who are trying to convey, you know, the reality of how viruses are transmitted and the fact that viruses don't have a nationality. Um, uh, so uh, some of the terminology that politicians have been using uh, is, is, uh, has been undermining that response. And so the importance of science-based information, I think, number one, is really critical and making sure that um, it really is public health and science that is driving what is out there, and that the CDC, amongst others, is seen as being a purveyor of that type of knowledge. Uh, so there are many complexities in the US specifically around those issues. Um, the second thing that I think, uh, you know, I would say here is, um, you know, cities and states have been at the forefront of really grappling with uh, the reality that their public health response is only as good as their ability to reach the most marginalized communities. In some contexts, it's going to be African-American communities, it's going to be Native American communities. In many contexts in cities and urban areas, it is migrant populations, undocumented populations. And I think um, we've seen, for example, um, uh, you know, cities like New York, um, uh, try and ensure that undocumented communities are able to access livelihood supports. They've been much more progressive in really thinking about access to testing and care 
for their undocumented workers. But I also think that there is another level of engagement um, that goes beyond just combating stigma and xenophobia, but that really draws on the contribution that migrant communities are making through their work, both in the healthcare sector, but in other essential services um, to really sustain our economies at this time. And so it's not just saying that, you know, this virus isn't transmitted by migrants, but it's saying, look, migrants here are part of the solution. And uh, through the work that they are doing, they're helping make you safer. They're helping keep your grandparents safe and sustained. And so really, um, uh, Adding that dimension into the public discourse, I think, is absolutely critical. And cities and states have been at the forefront of that. I'm sure my colleagues have other things to say, but I'd add those two things. Thanks very much, Manette. Could I turn to Dominic and just really uh, put the, the, the same sort of set of issues to him? Uh, I mean, how do you see it in, in Europe, Dominic? Uh, do we um, do you think that um, we're dealing with the same? challenges in relation to stigmatization uh, uh, i mean that would be that would be one uh, angle but another one is is the one that manette just touched on now um the the uh, kind of a redefinition of migrants as as actually key workers uh, key sustainers of the economy um i know that there are some important initiatives underway um in different parts of the world to bring this out more clearly and famously Boris Johnson praised the uh, assistance he got from two uh, migrant nurses or immigrant nurses. But do you have a sense in Europe, Dominic, that um, that that kind of more positive narrative about migration will will take hold? And finally, I have a point just about data from your own point of view. The issue of comparability across the European region. I wonder, could you uh, elaborate on that? Uh, because that, that, that's, that's actually quite an important dimension. Thank you, uh, David. So, um, so a, a couple of things. So stigmatization is, of course, um, very often something that happens as a result of uh, preconceived ideas and absence of good information, uh, which cannot be overemphasized. Uh, being on a data or information um, uh, webinar, I should be emphasizing that particularly. Why is that important? Um, it's um, uh, there are a lot of people that are trying to exploit that, uh, even in Europe. Um, they have not had as much success as they could have had, thankfully, I would argue. Um, and uh, some people have worked against that. I think I would uh, like to. Um, congratulate uh, um, Boris that he not even not only acknowledged um, his uh, migrant nurses, but also um, uh, named, I think, his uh, new uh, child after. So uh, so this is uh, this is um, something I, I think we should be mentioning. It's not going to go away. I think there's a need for having good data and the good data is not only um, for um, health systems, that's one thing. It's not only for, uh, for uh, stemming um, the epidemic and, and having a bit more granular and a bit more um, precise uh, instruments than, we, uh, than locking the entire society down. And, um, uh, but it's also uh, to uh, defeat uh, sort of um, wrong uh, um, uh, connotations, wrong ideas, um, and, and of course to stem xenophobia and stigmatization. So this is very, very important. Um, I think it's it's good, it's helpful to uh, see um, migrants as part of the solution. Um, uh, governments in Europe uh, have already um, uh, noted that uh, there is a problem with asparagus. The problem is that it's not being picked. And, um, and so, uh, so I think this is very helpful because it, it uh, shows that somehow solutions have to be found uh, within that and with the migrants themselves. Can I? Um, mention on this uh, um, occasion, which is very important, that we have been, uh, IOM that is, um, the, the larger we, um, been arguing for years uh, together with many other organizations that migrants should be um, part of plans, of national plans, especially, for example, of pandemic plans. This isn't the first pandemic, it's not the last pandemic, and, um, and uh, guess how many member states have included uh, migrants uh, in a meaningful way in uh, pandemic 
plants uh, in this case influenza plants but they were equally equip um, uh, um, were equally uh, applicable very very few i think we've got a study from a few years ago uh, from asia pacific region and it's got a handful it's got like three four countries or whatever and and it's not much better in europe uh, so just in case you wondered about that um, and why is this important because it acknowledges that a pandemic rests on being able to identify um, uh, interventions which are appropriate uh, and and tailored to the populations that you have it requires a lot of uh, in intelligence in the in the true meaning um, and therefore um, will be dealing with things like communication right the first thing is how do you communicate culturally, so, um, socially, um, linguistically appropriate communication um, is, is key. And, uh, it, it also would deal with counting. So do we, uh, do we know how many migrants are stranded at the moment, I would argue? How, do we know how many of, of those are actually at risk of uh, contracting uh, COVID and or have already contracted uh, the virus. And I do understand, and I'm sorry, and I'm not trying to uh, be critical to my friends, for example, for example, in WHO, who are doing an incredible piece of work and in, in, uh, in, in trying to, uh, in a very, very fast moving and very difficult scenario to, to try and uh, tackle some of these uh, things. But, uh, but, but just to, to say, we, we need to move on now. We are um, getting into a different phase. We were in lockdown phase. Now we need to move on and we need to get some better insight. Um, and then the, the other thing was about comparability. I, I don't know how comparable the countries were. I, uh, I quite care. That's what I meant. Um, yeah, so um, Europe's been going at slightly different speeds, although it's been only um, by some weeks apart. Um, I suppose um, that uh, some of the earlier countries are now seeming to uh, come out of the, or uh, come down. I mean, I, I'm sure that Rory will correct me with this. Uh, coming down on the um, on on the epidemic, such as, for example, perhaps Italy, uh, definitely Germany, and and some of the others, whereas some countries are still just at the early, perhaps um, cooling off phase, uh, like Britain, for example. Um, uh, so um, it's interesting also that basically um, uh, there has been um, there's been much more there's been uh, some studies on uh, on how the COVID is uh, distributed in western and eastern europe and and uh, amongst different populations and there is um uh, the epidemics are quite different in western and in eastern europe uh, meaning also in terms of numbers uh, um and it's in it's uh, it's a fascinating piece of work but it's a it's a rabbit hole so i don't want to go down there <laughs> but mm. just to say that uh, countries have been uh, implementing, and they're not as uniform also in the interventions in what one thinks, actually. So the interventions um, vary between something like Sweden, Germany, which is probably more, more like Sweden than they would realize, and something like, uh, for example, Spain uh, on the other extreme, which, uh, which has been quite uh, rigorous in, in terms of lockdown and stuff like that. And it's, it'll be fascinating when we do a post-mortem after all of this is over. Uh, to look at what worked and why it worked and, and, and these kind of things. I shall stop mumbling on. I hope you, I answered your questions reasonably. <laughs> did indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tommy. Thank you for that. And I'd, I'd just like to turn to Frank now and uh, to, to just to um, uh, really pursue some of the same themes, Frank. Um, I mean, uh, one of the points I think you touched on is, is the fact that we will now have to look to new sources of, of, of data. But if you like, this this was the case pre-COVID-19, but you talked about the, the, the value of private sector involvement, but that, that would be of interest to me. What new directions should we be going in in terms of, of collecting migration data, even outside the, the COVID-19 context? But Frank, can you come in on, on some of those points? Yes. Um... Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Okay. Um, before I get to that point on uh, data innovation and big data, can I just follow on from uh, Dominic and just stress that IOM has identified a number of priority areas uh, in relation to its uh, emerging response to COVID-19. And one of our top priorities is to address 
um, this growing concern about um, xenophobia and ensuring that we promote uh, a more positive narrative uh, around migration. Clearly, I think it's evident that migrants are essential workers. They've been uh, carrying out essential jobs during this crisis. A very high percentage of nurses and doctors in many of the most affected destination countries are foreign born. And of course, uh, we can go on and talk about all kinds of workers um, in uh, different sectors who often have a migration background. Now, what is really worrying is that we have seen an increase in, in uh, racist and xenophobic incidents. Uh, just today, I saw that in the UK, it's reported that the number of hate uh, crimes against people of Chinese origin has increased threefold. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing on the data front in IOM is making sure that we document as best as we can all these incidents. We need the data and the information. And of course, we also need the data about the positive contributions that migrants can make, but we also need to make sure that we uh, raise, the, we, we make, uh, we publicize the fact that these incidents are occurring and that this is totally unacceptable um, behavior. And we need to hold um, uh, different actors to account here. So that is one of the top priorities for IOM in this area. Now, as far as data innovation is concerned, we have something called the Big Data for Migration Alliance, which we launched a couple of years ago with the European Commission. We have a group of scientists there who work specifically on big data and migration topics. Uh, we recently had a um, discussion with that group uh, to uh, uh, share information about the emerging work that's being done in this area. And we've identified some interesting research that is being done in some of the, in seven European countries and also the United States. Um, using data that has been gleaned from Facebook, which identifies expats in a number of countries. People have been surveyed in several countries and asked questions about their access to healthcare during the pandemic and their behavior and their attitudes and their experiences. And from this um, information, it is possible to identify those who are foreign born. There is a, so we have information uh, potentially available on something like 16,000 uh, migrants from that uh, sample. So that work is currently underway and we're exploring how much that can tell us about this issue. But just to underline that traditionally um, uh, national statistical offices would tend to work with censuses, household surveys, administrative data, and they would tend not to work so much with the private sector that might be producing data on mobility in real time. And I think the world has changed and we are trying as IOM actually to create a space to foster a, a, more of a discussion between the private sector and the public sector around these issues, bearing in mind, of course, that there are still many concerns about data protection, privacy, et cetera. But uh, that, that is one of the things that we're, we're working towards. Great. Thanks very much, Frank. And I, I'd, I'd like to bring in Nuno at this point. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Uh, um, I, I would like to first raise a, a niche or a piece of work that we have been conducting and I didn't mention earlier on is uh, called Review of COVID-19 Digital Solutions and Implications on Mobility Data work. Um, uh, the, the recent solutions, and given that uh, you, uh, just yesterday, uh, Google and uh, Apple released to developers uh, new uh, codes uh, that uh, can be used in proximity uh, apps uh, with a set of uh, recommendations Interesting in the sense that um, these two companies are setting uh, some, uh, you know, a regulatory a regulatory environment with 
uh, developers and uh, colleagues working on data um, in uh, uh, an international environment where it's very difficult to, to come up with regulations for it. Um, and also, as, as part of that piece of work, um, one of the questions we saw here was on the data ownership. I think that is being discussed uh, differently between countries in terms of uh, uh, the use of uh, centralized uh, databases versus non-centralized uh, databases, uh, where uh, location and private data is shared or not shared. A question for us is um, how far in should we go in sharing data for research, uh, for which we have not had the time or we don't have the knowledge and experience uh, to assess uh, future risk. Uh, the, in our case, uh, the global map of uh, points of entry did not exist. Uh, we created it uh, with all airports, land borders, seaports. Is this a shareable database or not? So we are conducting our own sort of risk assessment. I saw some questions there. Um, uh, how the DTM addresses or can address the theoretical empirical suggestion to get the data beyond displaced people? Um, but what uh, uh, Dr. Dump has called displaced affected communities and populations in some countries, uh, not in all uh, because of uh, limitations that we have, but uh, in some countries we are able to do that uh, given that uh, assessments are already conducted at community level according to categories of uh, resident population, return population, etc. So not necessarily displaced, but that's a bit scattered depending on country and uh, the level of effort. Um, there is a second question uh, related to uh, uh, the, the migrants and refugees that got stuck and are not left behind. I think uh, in our migrant update that I cannot share externally, like some of the categories that we came upon were uh, migrants that are stranded, um, uh, migrants at sea, uh, migrants unable to uh, get out of boats uh, in different locations, including crews, um, uh, but also migrants that in border locations get stranded or uh, are unable to, to return home, etc. So I think that uh, right now what we are facing is a, a difficulty in categorizing issues uh, in order to capture them a bit better. For instance, uh, countries that are reconsidering or threatening uh, long-standing migration, uh, labor migration uh, links with other countries, if those countries do not repatriate their own migrants, we don't have a category really on where to put this and we are going away. Uh, the last one on the DTM travel restriction data, if um, IOM is analyzing how different types of travel restrictions affect mobility, migrants and the spread of the virus, um, in terms of how it affects mobility, certainly, uh, our portal is called the mobility impacts of COVID-19 um, and migrants. Uh, on the spread of the virus, then, we share the mobility data. We consider it's uh, probably the, the travel restrictions at international level might be the form of uh, social distancing uh, when we come into global, global scale. So, uh, trying to share this data with our health colleagues and uh, the show specifically, we are uh, engaging in discussions uh, to them to make use of that. We cannot say ourselves how it impacts on the spread of the virus. Thank you very much, Anu. So I'll now ask Lenini to present uh, a couple of other questions which have come from participants. Lenini, can you come in on this? Um, we have a few questions, uh, um, there we so um, we have a few questions that I'd like to take a bit forward with um, the different speakers. Um, the first relates to um, trafficking. I think there's an echo, there's a really bad echo. So the, the question related to trafficking, and I'll probably um, ask Monette and Katrina to come in on that, uh, and of course the other speakers is, 
Um, has any data been recorded during this pandemic on victims of trafficking or potential victims of trafficking? And how is the pandemic uh, affecting them? Uh, and if generally um, they've come across any targeted government response internationally on, on the issue of trafficking in persons. Um, so over to Katrina and Monette and of course uh, the other speakers. Um, thank you. I, I have focused mostly in, in what I was sharing in terms of forced displacement and not necessarily looking at that that specific issue around trafficking. So um, I don't have up to date information about that. But I think that you know the once we start to drill down into these questions about categories of migrants, I would say firstly thinking about trafficking, but also people mentioned detention as well. Migrants who are in detention and people who are trapped. I think those are clearly key priority areas. Um, but given what we've just heard, I think about the discrepancies and the gaps in data on migration more broadly, I think we have, it looks like we have a long way to go in terms of getting that reliable and really comprehensive data on those particular communities and groups of concern. Thank you, Katrina. Monette, would you like to come in uh, on that question as well uh, regarding uh, potential cases of trafficking or increased risks of trafficking in a context like COVID? Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, I second what Katriona has said, which is, you know, in context where our data is already, uh, gathering is already being challenged, this is a particularly difficult group. Um, so I'm not aware of specific data that I can point the, um, the questioner to, but we can extrapolate from what we've been hearing anecdotally that um, issues of trafficking uh, will incidences of trafficking will likely have increased. Um, if we just look at the lockdowns and how lockdowns are affecting domestic workers um, and also the increase that is being reported um, of uh, GBV and concerns around GBV and IPV in terms of the lockdown, we can speculate that domestic workers are finding themselves in situations in this lockdown where they're being subjected to um, you know, uh, exploitation, violence without the ability um, to be able to access the usual forms of support that are normally available. So that vulnerability in a lockdown is likely to be height heightened. Um, and, uh, you know, these are situations that would certainly, um, you know, rise to the level of trafficking. And we've also heard anecdotally that smuggling operations continue um, in the Mediterranean. So, Again, you know, the conditions for this to continue and to flourish are there. Um, we're just not at a, I don't think we're at a stage yet where we've been recording um, these, these elevations in, um, in these kinds of exploitative situations that the questioner is asking about. Thank you. Thank you, Monette. There's actually a, I mean, not a similar question, but a question regarding, um, just trying to, to get it on, on domestic violence. So is there also the same question to you and Katrina, probably on, on uh, different types of behaviors or, or risks that we've seen or, or consequences as a risk of, of increased prevalence of domestic violence um, within, I mean, these communities, uh, refugees and migrants? Um, thank you, maybe I can come in in the context of um, humanitarian crises specifically, we we simply don't have good enough data um, on that. We don't in, in humanitarian crises generally, except, you know, in spite of the best efforts of many organizations that are doing protection mapping, we often have patchy data on that. We don't have good data beyond um, a number of, of kind of cases, mainly in Europe or, or in, in data coming out of kind of North America saying there we're seeing a larger um, demand or requests for support kind of calls um, from people who are being victimized in those cases. So we're kind of extrapolating out from that. But what I would say is that it's, you know, it's a function of a number of things. And the first is that it's a function of this restriction on movement and isolation of people um, during a lockdown, if that's been, been imposed. The second is that it's a function of the withdrawal of other services. So the fact that humanitarian actors, for instance, are less able to provide wider protection services, wider public health services, when there are understandable um, concerns about movement and, and humanitarian access. And I suppose the third is just to emphasize some of those second order effects, particularly in humanitarian crises are not incidental. We're looking at over 135 million people, for instance, in a food crisis. 
uh, in the world today and the WFP warning that that could massively increase. That is profoundly gendered in terms of women's role uh, in food collection, women's role in food uh, preparation and food distribution in the household. And when we're looking at populations who are in, whether they're in camp or non-camp settings, if they're displaced, they are particularly vulnerable to informal economies, to access of humanitarian actors. And that can create enormous strain within the community, within the household, within the family. Um, and so those are the, the risk factors, but they're, they're, they're multifaceted. So I think we have um, many reasons to believe that will be the case and many reasons to believe, unfortunately, that some of those wider protection concerns are not going to get the focus and the the, the spotlight that they'll need um, for some time while our while we're focusing understandably on on this emerging crisis. Thank you, thank you, Katrina. We have a question from a PhD student at the University of Tessali in Greece, and his question is about the role that. Um, played by COVID-19 in driving mobility, both in low and high income communities. Um, so I, I'll open the question to the to all the speakers, whoever wants to come in first on that quite general question on the role played by COVID-19 in driving mobility in both low but also high income communities. would like to, to come in there so i mean i can at least start us off this is uh you know i mean i think it's a very interesting question because i think we are going into a new era in which we have to reconceptualize our our our, our understanding of mobility in many ways but you know that question makes me think of the unintended consequences of the way some of these lockdowns were handled where we saw in India, for example, mass internal migration as people, uh, as migrants sought to return back to their home villages, um, you know, uh, within the very limited time frame they had before lockdowns were imposed. So you did see, um, you know, uh, co contrary to what I think, you know, many policymakers were anticipating, were mass movements of people trying to avoid uh, the emergency measures that um, were imposed. I mean, sitting here in New York and teaching at a university, I can tell you that there was a, a lot of rapid movement uh, of our students, for example, who also went home in anticipation of uh, locking down and hunkering down um, for months. So there was an uptick um, here. Uh, uh, I imagine that may have been replicated in other high income settings, but in low income settings as well, um, where shutdowns uh, were given with um, uh, perhaps without due consideration for what the ramifications might be, we did see these mass movements of people trying to to uh, to get home to a place where they could sustain themselves during this period. So those are just two thoughts that that came to mind that we should look back on and reflect on. I think at some stage. Thank you, Manette. Anyone else wants to come in um, on that question? Any members of the panel? Otherwise, um, I'll take two other. We have, we've, ha we've been having a few, uh, quite a number of questions, but I'll probably take two uh, last questions uh, for the panel. One is about uh, the issue of seroprevalence survey testing of the COVID. And some countries have initiated uh, such approach, and uh, the, sp the, the, the the attendee wanted to know what was recommended uh, in terms of seroprevalence um, so surveys. Uh, Sorry, a technical question where Dominic or Ruri or someone uh, with a very strong public health or health background could respond to that, probably. I could come in here, Lalini uh, Ruri here. Sure, please go ahead. Um, yes, some some countries are actually carrying out large uh, surveys. And if you even look back a few weeks, the UK were positing their whole approach on the idea of herd immunity, that somehow you could demonstrate uh, large numbers of people who were immune. Uh, you could have these immunity pass passports. I think we just need to be cautious at the moment and go with the WHO view on this, which is that uh, some of, even the Roche survey that was mentioned, um, it, it's actually a qualitative survey. It identifies, it doesn't quantify, 
the antibody levels. That's according to my sister-in-law now, who is who's part of actually uh, uh, in reproducing these these surveys in in the Roach factory in Ireland. And we just don't know what they mean. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't value in carrying them out, uh, but I did say earlier there are problems with their test characteristics. Uh, in, in, in initially, they were developed in, in hospitals where there were very high levels of antibodies, and then when they were run in community settings, they were missing a lot of, of cases. I think just the, 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 the jury is out on them at the moment, but I think as soon as they become available, they could be very useful. Once they've been tested and found to be useful, they could give us important information about the, the vulnerability of communities, how many have been infected. There's a lot of scientific uncertainty still around uh, COVID-19. You know, 50% of uh, cases are uh, transmitting the virus are thought to be asymptomatic. But there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot we just don't know about it at the moment. Thank you very much, Rui, for that. Um, perhaps a last question uh, from the attendees is around ownership of data. And this is coming from um, Diego, who Frank mentioned initially. Um, in his in his presentation and it's around ownership of data as i said so in a crisis situation like now data can be held and not shared by those whom the data reflects upon how do we ensure data is shared to make sure that it is used to make for evidence-based decisions and um, such decisions are not made on a whim over to Whoever wants to respond to to that question on ownership of data, Frank or I can come in, Lalin. Sure, please, uh, Nuno. Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned briefly uh, the work on uh, reviewing digital solutions and uh, platforms uh, that are requesting us and other actors to mix data sets for the benefit of research and where, um, you know, together with, I guess, with regular citizens around the world, um, we are tempted to uh, not consider previous restrictions in terms of sharing data, but we are also not very sure of the impacts they may have. So I guess there will be uh some body of evidence arising from these crises in terms of um how privacy as it used to be um taken before the covid uh, response uh, will evolve over the the next uh, yes. a, a big discussion uh, is on uh, individual level mobility data uh, and location data, and for those, uh, I will not get too much into it here, but uh, there, there is plenty of um, literature that is starting to come up about trade-offs on privacy versus uh, research or uh, health surveillance. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Nuno. Um... I think we will probably stop with all the with the questions uh, because um, I mean we're not running out of time. We could continue, I'm sure, but it's already four past four o'clock um, Irish time at least. Um, and um, on my end, I'd like to um, to thank the panelists and the attendees for this very very rich uh, exchange uh, today. And I'll pass the floor on to um, David for the closing remarks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lenini. Um, indeed, thank you for the entire initiative. that has been a terrific uh, webinar. I don't have very much to say other than to remark how rich it was, how detailed, how wide ranging. Uh, we got a terrific set of speakers and, and set of questions indeed. And um, we, well, for me, I think, the first point to make is that we have um, identified very clearly the need for timely, that's to say real-time, um, uh, accurate and disaggregated data on the predicament of migrants and refugees in the current COVID-19 situation especially. We've, we, as Frank remarked at the beginning, there has been a need for the last number of years 
to develop such data for migrants in, in peacetime, as it were. Now we have even greater urgency uh, in, in developing um, similar data uh, now that they are even more vulnerable than normal. Migrants are particularly exposed at present because uh, of the pandemic itself, the exposure, that the risks that they face, but also because of the uh, opportunistic exploitation of the crisis by a number of governments. Uh, uh, and, and it's fairly obvious that those pressures will, will increase. So it is all the more important that we, we can provide scientific data, as a number of the colleagues have, have emphasized, um, evident, an evidence base for the humane policy decisions which governments must take in this situation. So, for me, that was the great value of the webinar, and I hope that we can build on this. We've heard about uh, plenty of good initiatives which are underway. We've heard about the detailed work that WHO and IOM and other UN agencies are doing in this area. Um, at the same time, gaps are very obvious. We had a whole range of um, gaps identified in what is currently available, uh, gaps that we all need to plug. Um, the quality of the data is uh, is deficient in from often for reasons beyond our control, but uh, there is an awful lot of work that needs to be done. Concrete recommendations were made by our speakers, and uh, there's a lot to to reflect on from that. Um, I know that IOM and WHO will continue to work to fill those gaps to uh, to deepen the the evidence base I'm talking about. Um, there's a role also for um, the academic research community, for the private sector, and for civil society. So I, I would like to think that this webinar will be the first of a number of such initiatives which could try to uh, map out more clearly the, the needs and the directions that we have to go in. So again, thanks to everybody for having taken part. Um, and most of all, thanks to our first class speakers and to Lalini for having this initiative and also to Frank from Jim Jack in Berlin. For me, it was a, it was a very, a very great pleasure. Thank you to everybody.